Let's get into this morning's message. Uh, continuing in our series that we've entitled uh, uh, Becoming God's Church. Uh, we, we've reflected on a, a few thoughts as a, a basic overview. Um, being the people of God. Uh, what, what it is to, to be the, the church of God. Uh, this morning I've entitled the message, uh, The Church Being the Body of Christ Today. Being the Body of Christ uh, Today. It's one thing to know what the scriptures teach concerning the past, yet it's something else to take that knowledge, that revelation, those great truths of Scripture, and to put them into practice today. Uh, to, to live as God purposed the church would live. To be as God has purposed the church to be today. The, the picture of the church contained in the New Testament is different from the images that often come to mind when we speak of the church today, uh, once again, the, the image that we get, the revelation that we capture of the present day church is often different from that which we capture, the revelation that we can garner from the New Testament. I think it helps us to study anew, afresh, what the New Testament Scripture has to say about the church and then to put forth sincere efforts to be that church that God has purposed the church to be hence the title of this whole series that we become God's church not, not, not the idea of what man has created for the church to be but that we become the church that God has created for us to be the church is much more than just an organization. It's living. It's active. I think more appropriately we could say that the church should be an organism more than it is an organization. And as a couple points of reflection, review before I get into this morning's message, I want to identify three brief things with you. Number one, that Christ is the source of the life of the church, which is the body of Christ. He, he is that source of life. He came to earth as we identified. He died on the cross that we might receive that beautiful gift of eternal life. I, I want you to capture today that eternal life should be thought of as more qualitative rather than quantitative. The quality of life versus the quantity of that life. But Christ is the source of the life of the church. Number two, that Christ is the sustainer of the life of the body. He's the source, but he also is the sustainer. In his, Jesus' initial announcement to his apostles concerning the church... He promises to, to sustain this institution through which he works to accomplish his redemptive purpose. Matthew 16, verse 18, I'll just give it to you briefly. He declares, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Why? Because not only is he the source of the body, he's also the sustainer of the body, working on behalf of his body. Lastly, number three, that Christ is sovereign over his body. Sovereign. We often refer to the pastor maybe as the overseer, the manager, the bishop, whatever that classification is, but we still must recognize that Jesus is the Lord of his church. I believe deacons, elders, just as well as pastors have a, an important ministry to render within the church. But one of those is not running the church. 
Sometimes we confuse that in a man-made church, that the pastor or the elders or deacons are, are there to run the church. Could I submit to you there's only one boss of the church? That's Jesus. There's only one head of the church. There's only one head of the body. And that's already been appointed. That's already been established. That being Jesus Christ himself. To be the Lord, the head of the church, means that God has appointed him to that position of authority of his body, of his church. As the head of the church, Christ has been given the right to make those requests, to, to issue those orders, to, to make requisitions, to, to make change where he finds necessary to make change. If, if we as the body want to experience a rich and an abundant life that the scripture identifies, we must recognize that we belong to him and act like he is the one who's sovereign in control of the church. The New Testament views the church, once again, as we're identifying today as the body of Christ, which has been constituted through, I believe, the work of the Holy Spirit in all who have submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So join with me as we gain Revelation, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Pick up with me in the 12th verse. It reads, the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one spirit in to one body. Whether Jews or Greek, slave or free, we were all given that one spirit to drink. Verse 14, now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. Now, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? If, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one parts, where would the body be? Verse 20, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. Many parts, but one body. Just a little bit further. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Father, we say thank you for your word this morning. Lord, help us to walk in your revelation. Lord, as we desire continuously to become the church that you have purposed, and plan for us to become. God, as we strive to walk in your revelation, in the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to identify a few things that we can gain uh, from the context of Scripture this morning and what it is to be the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Number one, as Scripture identifies in the very first verse I read, the 12th verse, that there is unity in the body. Unity. The body needs unity. It doesn't function right if there's not unity. Once again, verse 12, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. A, a little historical background for thought today. The church at Corinth that we're looking at from the, uh, the teachings of the Apostle Paul today was divided and torn apart for various reasons. Uh, one of them is because it believed to, uh, to have a, a party spirit, a festive spirit. And with that, there was much rivalry within the church. 
So Paul writes this epistle to try to to help, to correct, we might say more appropriately, to solve some of the problems that were creating division within the church. And he tries to identify from the very beginning that in order for the the body to function appropriately, there must be unity within the body. We don't rival, we don't compete against one another. We're to build, to encourage, and to inspire one another. I I identified this morning that uh, the power of life and death is on the tongue. What was happening in the church of Corinth is that they were destroying the church by how they were treating, sharing, talking, responding uh, to one another. The rivalry begins to grow, to, 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 to multiply within the church. And before long, it, it p- appears as though there, there, there is no unity within the church. Uh, let me identify, as I'll get to it in just a moment, there, there can be differences and yet be unity within the church. Uh, look to the person to your right and to your left. Do you look like them? Can you say, thank God? (laughs) No, don't do that. We don't all have to be alike for there to be unity. There's beauty in difference if we allow there to be so. But that yet we're still walking in one accord, the Bible says. Unity. Unity in how we, how we relate, respond, grow together within the body of Christ. Number two, as we've briefly identified, there's diversity in the body. I believe there's great diversity that's identified in the body as illustrated through the various organs that make up a physical body, a human body. There's different organs of the human body, but... Please understand, they all have their unique function. They all have their job that they must accomplish to work in unison, one with each other. 1 Corinthians 12, catching up a little before of what I just read in verse 4, it declares that there are different kinds of spirits. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all, all men. Just, just a little bit further, verse 7. Now, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. Sometimes when we talk about diversity, we often look at race. But that's not, I don't believe, what's being identified here. We have different gifts. Diversity of of gifts. Uh, We we have this new ministry in the church, the, the, the helps ministry. Beautiful. That God can use what he's gifted you to do in order to help the rest of the body to encourage, to inspire. We're, we're going to get to this a little bit more, but if I, if I don't use that gifting, and if I don't use that, that function that God has purposed, then we're, we're lacking diversity within the body, and the body doesn't accomplish what the body's purposed and plan to be able to accomplish. God has uniquely created each one of us. How beautiful is that? You you have things that you can do that I can't do. You have things that you can do that the person to the right and the left can't do. We all have things that all of us are supposed to do. 
If I don't walk in that uniqueness of the gifting, and if I don't walk in fulfillment of what all of us are supposed to do, then, then, then I'm not only hurting myself, I'm hurting the body of Christ. I'm minimizing the, the function of the body of Christ. I have to walk in that uniqueness. I have to walk in that fulfillment. Why? So that the body accomplishes what the body was purposed to accomplish. Number three, that there's harmony. Harmony within the body. The scripture helps us with this. Let, let, me, let me just give you a few thoughts in regards to there being harmony within the body. Let me give you four distinct things. Number one, no members are to look down on themselves because they do not have a gift that another member has. Let me give you this scripture one more time, beginning in verse 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one parts, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Once again, no members are to look down on themselves because they do not have the gift that a number, another member has. Can I be honest? I used to be guilty of this. I wanted so bad to be able to do something different. Anybody ever had that experience? One more, at least, at least me and Kelly are together. I, I wanted to be able to play an instrument. I wanted, some of you have heard, I wanted to be able to sing. I just don't have those giftings. But people do. But thank God he's gifted me to do something different. Something different. So just walk in humility and say, thank you, God, for gifting me the way that you have gifted me. And I purpose to function in the way that you have uniquely gifted me to function. Number two, though individual member of the body is to be considered as less or little value or as being unneeded within the body, no matter how small it might appear. Everything is significant. Everything is important within the body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Verse 21, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Every part is uniquely needed within the body of Christ. Number three, no individual member is to act superior to the other members of the body. There's not one part that's greater than the other parts. Every part is needed within the body of, of Christ. Lastly, number four, no member is to be treated as inferior to the other members. We identified earlier that today's uh, the Super Bowl. Anybody watching the Super Bowl? If you know me, you know that I, I like sports. Uh, if I watch anything on TV, I would say 95% of the time it's sports. I know I'm kind of crazy. It amazes my wife that I can even sit and watch bowling if there's nothing else on TV. I just like it. I like anything along those lines. But for a football team to win, not everybody can be a quarterback. All players have to be willing to play their position. In the analogy of a football team, you've got to have a quarterback. You have to have a, a running back or two. In today's modern version, maybe just one, but then you've got to have a receivers. Uh, th those that do that particular thing. You've got to have a, a tackle. You've got to have a, a guard. You've got to have a center on the offensive side. And each position has to do their job. 
The center can't do the job of a wide receiver. The wide receiver can't do the job of a quarterback. Why? Because the team probably won't win. Because the center's probably not gifted to be a wide receiver. A wide receiver is probably not gifted to be a quarterback. But they're uniquely gifted to do what they can do. And they're the ones that are chosen in order to, to do that job. One of the teams have become very popular for this statement, the New England Patriots, who were the darlings and now seem to be the villains of the NFL. But you often hear the coach, if you listen in carefully, and the quarterback say the same thing, when things don't go right. Tom Brady, the quarterback, will get the receivers over there, and he'll yell at them one thing. Do your job. Do your job. Belichick, the coach, will get the linebackers on the defense when it's not going right. And they're trying to point to other people, because why? That's what people do when things don't go right. We, we, we start trying to, to figure out where somebody else messed up, and they'll start yelling at their, at their linebackers, do your job. I think that works good in the body of Christ also. I think God would say, do your job. I, I've uniquely gifted you to do what you're supposed to do. There's nobody that's in fear. There's no position because if you don't have a center, you're not winning. If you don't have a guard, you're not winning. If you don't have a tackle, you're not going to win. If you don't have the other positions, you're not going to win as a team. God has gifted the functions, the parts within the body. Why? So that the body could accomplish greatness as God has planned and purpose for that body to accomplish. Number four for you today, there's solidarity of the body. Solidarity. Back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse, verse 12. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all the parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body. Let, let me give you one more scripture, skipping to the end of this, verse 24. It says, while all presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division within the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Solidarity in the body. Once again, if one member suffers, all the other should suffer with that member. If one is honored, all the other members should rejoice with that member. The members of the body are to have the same care for each other as they would have for themselves. The same care for each other that we would have for our own selves. Why? Because ultimately we are one body. The church is one body functioning under the head, which is Jesus Christ. So it leads me to last this morning, number five, being the body of Christ. Being the body of Christ. The church, as I identified, is a living organism through which the living Christ carries out his purpose and performs His work in this present age. There are some great truths that I believe that we have to learn to accept, but we also must learn to practice as we grow in doing our part and grow in what it is to be the body of Christ. Realizing that Christ came through His Spirit to live within each part of the body. How do I know? Revelations 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Galatians 2.20 says, I, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ now lives within me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Realizing that, that we are the living body of Christ. 
as Christ lives within each one of us. Because of so, let me identify a few things. Christ came and has chosen to make our body a dwelling place for his spirits. A dwelling place for his spirit. Because of so, he sees through our eyes the needs of others and the opportunities for ministry and service unto the Lord, our God. He sees through our eyes. He hears through our ears the needs of others and the ministries and services that need to take place. He thinks through our minds, hang with me, and fills us with the very thoughts of God. Only when we begin to think like Jesus can we truly become like Jesus. Christ came to live within us so that the work of our hands are literally rendering, rendering ministry and mercy and helpfulness in the world that, that our hands could become the hands of Jesus Christ. Christ came in us that he might walk through the world with our feet to carry his gospel to all that we would encounter. Hear me as I begin to conclude. We are the body of Christ. We are the eyes, the ears, if allowed to be the mind, the hands, the feet of Christ, as by his spirit he dwells within each one of us. Are you willing to allow your uniqueness, your giftings, to be used within God's body and do the part that God has purpose for us to do? You would say, I don't know if I'm there yet. Well, if you haven't asked Christ to come into your life and to accept his forgiveness. I, I believe he's here with us today. I believe that he's available for you today to begin that new relationship. He, I believe he stands at the door of your heart as Revelation identifies knocking, knocking, wanting to come in and wanting to bring uniqueness, wanting to bring gifts into your life. You just have to trust in him and say, Lord, here I am. I want to be a part of your body. I want to be an ear. I want to be an eye. I want to be a hand. I, I, I want to be a, a foot today. I wonder, are you willing? Maybe you're already a part of the body. Maybe you've been struggling with your uniqueness. Can I share a thought that the Lord imposed upon me this week? Pridefulness is costly. It's costly. When I walk in pride and say, I don't want to be an ear. I want to be the mouth. I don't want to be the foot. I want to be the hands. It's costly, not only in your life, but in the body of Christ. Humility is so much cheaper. Humility is so much better. Sometimes we say, I'm just, I'm tired of doing that. I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. God would say, just do your job. Just do what I've gifted you to do. Just do what I have purposed you to do. I, I understand. Sometimes we quit because we don't like how things have, ha have gone. We don't like what somebody else has done. But those people, that individual, they're not the one that gifted us. They're not the one that commissioned us. God is. And I have to answer to God whether I just did my job. Whether I did my job. 
and we can help others to maybe to discover that uniqueness as we become the eyes of Christ. So some people are blinded to the uniqueness of others. I, I shared this this morning. I walked in Sam's just a couple days ago. I had a sales lady try to stop me and try to sell me something. You're not going to believe what she tried. I, I think she was blinded. She was pretty forceful. She was trying to sell me a hair straightener and a blow dryer. <laughs> I said, ma'am, just look at me. Do you think I'm going to buy one of those things? <laughs> well, maybe you can buy it for your wife. I said, no way I'm buying it. I don't even know how they work. <laughs> but sometimes we do that in the body of Christ. We miss it. Lord, help us to see. Help us to recognize our function and to appropriately do what we've been gifted to do. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning, church.